Well, hello again. The late broadcaster Sir David Frost famously began his TV show Frost on Sunday with the greeting, Hello, good evening and welcome. Well, I am no David Frost, but I would like to paraphrase that greeting today by saying hello, good morning, good afternoon or good evening and welcome. As it seems people tune into YouTube videos at all times, day and night these days. This week, I'm going to be looking at a fascinating passage in the book of Matthew, chapter 21. It's the parable of the talents, but let's not turn there just yet. First of all, I want to go way back into the Old Testament, all the way to the book of Daniel. It's Daniel chapter 2, and let's begin in verse 1. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled, and he could not sleep. So here we see Nebuchadnezzar, a powerful king, so powerful that historians regard him as the greatest king of the great Babylonian Empire. But he's not happy, is he? He isn't sleeping too well because his mind is troubled. And why is he troubled? Well, because of a particular dream he has had. So he calls for his fife and he calls for his drum and he calls for his fiddlers three no, not really. He summons his magicians, his entertainers, his enchanters, his sorcerers and astrologers. <clears throat> so, what does he do? He calls for his fife and he calls for his drum and he calls for his fiddlers three. No, not really. He summons his magicians, his enchanters, sorcerers and astrologers and he orders them to interpret the dream, to tell him what it all means. And the astrologers are confident that they can do it, really confident. So they say, then the astrologers answered the king, may the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we will interpret it. But the king is having none of it. He doesn't just want them to interpret the dream, he wants them first to tell him what the dream was. Verses 5 to 6. He tells them, This is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honour. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Well, that is a pretty tall order, isn't it? You'd better tell me both what my dream was and what it means, or else I'll have you turned into chopped liver and I'll send in a JCB to demolish your houses. So how do those guys react? Well, they try to negotiate. Verse 7. Let the king tell his servants the dream and we will interpret it. What are they doing? Well, they are trying to negotiate. They're trying to get the king to change his order. Tell us the dream and we'll interpret it. No bother at all. Which makes the king livid. I don't suppose you get to become the most powerful king ever without being able to tell when someone's pulling the wool over your eyes and straight away he sees right through their not so cunning plan. Verses 8 to 9. Then the king answered, I am certain that you are trying to gain time because you realise that this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, there is only one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then, tell me the dream, and I will know that you can interpret it for me. And then, verses 10 to 11, the astrologers answered the king, There is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer 
What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among humans. Next verse. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death, and men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. Now the situation has become deadly serious. Whereas before the king was threatening to kill his magicians and his astrologers, and now he's really going to do it. And not just the magicians and astrologers, but all of the wise men were to be put to death. And that meant that Daniel and his friends were to use a modern vernacular in deep doo-doo. So Daniel doesn't hesitate. He speaks to the commander of the king's guard to ask for more information. And then he goes direct to the king and asks him for more time. And then what he does is interesting. He goes back to his friends and he asks them to pray and plead for mercy from the God of heaven that they might not be executed with the rest of those wise men of Babylon. And then during the night, something incredible happens. God reveals the mystery in a vision to Daniel. So after thanking and praising God, Daniel goes straight to the king's commander and says, don't kill those wise men. Take me to the king and I will interpret his dream. So the commander takes Daniel to the king at once, saying, here is a man who can tell you what your dream means. And the king says, as he did before, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? But Daniel begs to differ. Let's look at what he says in verses 27 to 28. Daniel replied, No wise man, enchanter, magician or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you are lying in bed are these. So Daniel, just like Joseph before him, when he also was asked to interpret a dream by a very powerful king, the Pharaoh, Daniel makes sure the first thing he does is to give the credit to God. Daniel tells the king, no one can explain this mystery except God in heaven. And then he tells Nebuchadnezzar both the dream and the meaning. The king dreamt that before him stood an enormous statue, awesome in appearance. Its head was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, and its feet partly of iron, and partly of baked clay. Nebuchadnezzar and his Babylonian empire were represented by the head. As Daniel put it, you are that head of gold. And then in verses 39 to 40, he continues, After you, another kingdom will arise, inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, and finally a fourth kingdom, strong as iron. And almost all scholars today agree that Daniel's interpretation of the dream describes four empires ruling after one another. The second empire is the Medes and the Persians. The third empire is that of the Greeks and Macedonians. And the fourth empire is the Romans. It's a dramatic vision and a compelling interpretation. But we must leave the statue behind for now because what happens next is even more dramatic and even more 
compelling. Verses 44 to 45. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver and the gold to pieces. A giant rock that smashes the statue to pieces, symbolising the kingdoms of the world being replaced by a new kingdom, one that will never be destroyed, the kingdom of God. But what on earth has this got to do with our theme scripture in Matthew 21? Well, let's go there and find out. I'll first of all read through the parable to get an overview, beginning in Matthew 21 and verses 33 to 34. And this is Jesus talking primarily to the chief priests and the Pharisees. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall round it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. And then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. And then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them in the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. This parable is pretty easy to understand. The land owner is God the Father. The vineyard is Israel. The tenants represent the religious authorities, the very people that Jesus was telling the parable to. The servants, well, they are the prophets, all the way up to John the Baptist. And the son, of course, is Jesus himself. But it's such a powerful and sorrowful story. Jesus here is telling his own story. The story of how he came to earth to confront those tenant farmers and demand that they repent. But sadly, they will refuse and will end up killing him. Let's continue in verses 40 to 41. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, verse 40, what will he do to those tenants? Well, this is marvellous. We see Jesus here asking the chief priests and the Pharisees what will happen to the tenants. And remember, the tenants are the characters in the story who represent Israel's ruling religious authorities. And Jesus asks these people, these very people, what is going to happen to them at the end? And in verse 41 we see that they condemn themselves with their own words. He will bring those wretches to our wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. And I really think at, at this point in the story that they didn't understand that Jesus was talking about them. But very soon they would. Verse 42 Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvellous in our eyes. Well, of course, they had read the scriptures. They knew the scriptures inside out. They knew that Jesus was quoting from Psalm 118, verses 22 and 23. They'd read the scripture all right. They just hadn't understood it. Jesus is telling them 
that the son of the landowner, the son who was rejected and killed, is the same as the stone that will become the chief corner, cornerstone, meaning that he himself will take the place of highest honour in the building, the building representing Israel, the church, and the coming kingdom of God. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvellous in our eyes. This part of the verse is a direct quote from Psalm 118, which is also known as the Hosanna Psalm. Why is it called that? Because it is the psalm that the adoring crowd shouted to Jesus when he made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. If you remember, he rode into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey's colt. Now we can read about this in the very same chapter of Matthew that we've been looking into today, just at the beginning of that chapter. In Matthew 21, verses 7 to 9. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! And that last part is a direct quote from Psalm 118. Hosanna means save us or saviour. So by quoting from Psalm 118, Jesus is telling the chief priests and the Pharisees not only that he is the foundation stone of the kingdom of God, but also that he is the coming Messiah, the King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. And now we come to verse 43, which takes us full circle and back to where we started in Daniel chapter 2. Matthew 21 and verse 43. Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. This is the stone prophesied in Daniel 2. The rock cut out, but not by human hands. The rock that struck the statue and that will crush all those man-made kingdoms and bring them to an end, ushering in a kingdom that can and will never be destroyed. And that rock is Jesus. Jesus, the chief foundation stone that everything else is built on. The rock cut out without hands who will destroy all of the world's decaying empires and replace them with a kingdom of love and light that will endure forever. Jesus, the rock of ages and the solid rock that we sing about in those two great old hymns. Surely he is the rock that we should build our spiritual houses on. Let us pray. Almighty loving Father, thank you so much for Jesus, the stone that the builders rejected, but who nevertheless became the foundation of the soon coming kingdom of God, the rock cut out without hands who will destroy the teetering kingdoms of this world and usher in a wonderful, glorious new world of peace, love and happiness for all. Thank you that he is solid and sure, safe and secure, the solid rock that we can trust with everything we have. And in his name we pray this. Amen. Well, thanks again for joining me today. And just a reminder that this coming Wednesday evening at 7.30pm there will be a joint 
National Zoom prayer meeting and you can find the link for that on our website www.gracecom.church and of course there will be another service here on YouTube at the same time next Sunday. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.